Hi, everyone. Welcome to our evening with Michael Libby, who is the CEO and founder of World Builder. Um, we're going to bring him on and he's going to tell everyone a bit about his experience starting World Builder and we'll hear a bit more. So, Michael, welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah. So why don't we go ahead and start with giving everyone a bit about your background? My background. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, um, I think I have a pretty friendly crowd here because it's probably a bunch of theme park enthusiasts. Um, my background is, is as a theme park designer. Um, I started out in operations at Disneyland while I was in college at USC. Um, and uh, then I worked in the industry for about five years as a creative director and writer. Um, then went back to USC. Um, got a master's degree in interactive media and game design in the film school. And, you know, I uh, learned a lot, obviously, about game design, but also about the tools, um, you know, some of these new tools like, uh, you know, Unity and Unreal and virtual reality. And um, got really excited about how they, they uh, are going to impact our industry in, in the near future. Um, so... Now I've been out of grad school for about five years, and um, you know I use these new skills every day. That's awesome. Yeah. So, how do you think your time as a cast member? Because I know you spent some time back in school. How do you think that influenced your decision with going into the creative, and how that's influenced you in your time? Well, it's really more um, that the creative influenced my decision to become a ride operator, and. Uh, tell a really quick story about this. So um, when I was 16, I was, I was introduced through a mutual contact to Tony Baxter, who you had on your show yeah. uh, a week ago, two weeks ago. Uh, yeah. like and, um, you know, I was 16, but Tony very graciously gave me a tour of WDI and, you know, talked to me about his job and and every aspect of the process and this was when they had um a absolutely beautiful artist's model of tokyo disney sea uh in a building over there called mapo and legend has it it was a million dollar model and it was painted you know that volcanic sculpt and all, all of this stuff. And, you know, like when I saw that model, I was just like, okay, this is it. I'm sold. Um, yeah. And it was Tony that gave me the advice, you know, they don't have any jobs for 16 year olds, but he said, you know, when you, when you become of age, you should work at the park. Um, he started there as an ice cream scooper. Um, and I got hired there, I want to say 2002 um 2003 something like that and i worked on a ton of attractions actually i my i spent the most time far and away at the jungle cruise which still probably to this day is the best job that i've ever had <laughs> um but you know i really wanted to sort of soak up all of the you know i i i was there to work and you know yeah. have some discretionary money for college and stuff but Really, I was there to learn and to study. And um, in addition to Jungle Cruise, I worked Thunder Mountain and the Tiki Room and uh, Steam Trains and the Opera House and Autopia and the Submarines and Space Mountain and Star Tours and uh, Toy Story Mania. And I think that's it. Um, but those are, oh, and of course, guest control parades and Phantasmic. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, the old two finger points, guys, yeah. right? Um, and so, you know, I, I learned so much about operations and about the guest experience. I mean, you know, we we always talk about the guest experience, um, but a lot of times in our industry, we do just that. We we just talk about it. But being there on the front lines, dealing with guest complaints seeing firsthand how they don't, you know, read signage. Um, people never read. It's the one thing I've learned is people will not read right. a sign. And you have to learn that. You have to learn that. Yeah. And then, you know, 
people pay money to go to these places to have a great experience. And, you know, there's no better way to sort of understand the totality of that experience um, than to work there. Because then it's not theoretical anymore. It's, it's, oh, this is how it, you know, all of our designs and all of our theories, this is how it actually plays out. And so, so that knowledge has been incredibly valuable for me. Also just learning, learning ride operations. If, you know, if you want to be a creative person in this industry, um, you know, it's a, it's a real, uh, there's a really steep learning curve. You know, there's a whole vocabulary that you have to learn, you know, the dispatch interval and THRC and, you know, reach envelope and all this stuff. And I, I frankly don't know how other people learn that stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I learned it, um, by working at the park. So I came in very prepared, um, into the industry. And my, my big break in, in the industry, it's, this is sort of the story coming full circle, is um, I moved from the jungle. So in the summer of 2007, I moved from the Jungle Cruise to the Submarine Voyage ride when it was reopening as the Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage. Um, and they brought me over as one of the earliest ride operators there because it actually operates very similarly to the Jungle Cruise in the sense that, you know, there are eight vehicles. Uh, each vehicle has an operator in it. You know, downtime procedures and evacuation procedures are very similar. Um, so it made sense for me to go over there early. And, and it's called uh, uh, test and adjust is kind of the last phase before opening, where in theory, the construction is wrapping up and finished and the show has been installed. And it's really more about getting the operators um, you know, comfortable operating the ride and exposing maybe some operational flaws that the designers didn't necessarily uh, think about. So I was there um, as a test and adjust operator, and it was—I mean, that was that was just a crash course for me. It was—it uh, it was a whole summer. I was actually working third shift from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> And what was unique and interesting about that was in order to program the show scenes, WDI had to be inside the submarine, you know, to get the perspective of what the guests would see through those portholes. But they were, but you know, the, the submarines are heavy machinery. Um, and so therefore the designers were not authorized to operate the ride vehicles. So basically what I would do was I would, uh, drive the creative lead for that attraction. Uh, it was a guy named Rick Rothschild. I would drive him into a scene, park, and then just watch him work for eight hours, and then you know drive him back to the dock at the end of the day. And I learned so much from him, and just from that whole experience. And and it really came full circle because I I ended up being the person at the submarines who would sort of drive VIPs. Um, around, you know, while it was still under construction, I would, I would take visiting guests around, um, you know, so they could see the attraction as, as it was under construction. And uh, early one morning, there was an unannounced visit to the dock at the submarines. And I'm not making this up. It sounds like I'm making this up. But it was Bob Iger, Steve Jobs, John Lasseter, and Tony Baxter. And they wanted to take a ride. And, um, you know, so I took them around. And uh, actually, the power went out about halfway through. <laughs> These things happen. But, yeah. um, you know, it was, it, it was fascinating to hear from that, that cockpit, you know, what Steve Jobs thought of the ride. Um, he was not 100% complimentary. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just fascinating to be a fly on the wall there. It's just an incredible learning experience. Oh, right. And the full circle aspect of it is <laughs> when those people got off of the submarine, you know, it's like, yeah, Steve Jobs, great. Bob Iger, great. I was mostly starstruck by Tony, to be honest. And so I approached Tony and said, like, hey, um, I don't know if you remember me, but, like, you told me to get a job here. <laughs> and uh, here I am. So... Good to see you again. And he did remember me. And 
basically recommended me for a writing internship at Imagineering. Um, and that was kind of my first break. So, you know, I, I can trace it all back to operations. Absolutely. And it has helped me every single day to this day, knowing how things really work. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like everyone gives the advice of getting into operations. Um, yeah. So it's nice to hear a bit more about how that actually helped you. Um, so going off the fact that you were also at USC during part of the time you were working at Disney, um, in operations. How do you feel that USC then helped you since we have a lot of USC current students listening? <laughs> what are some things that you wish you'd done or things that help you did feel help, if that makes more sense? I, that's a good question. I, I wish I had spent more time socializing at USC. Um, I got really swept up in the camaraderie of the Jungle Cruise skippers and the cast member parties and get togethers and things like that. And it was really interesting because I was studying creative writing at USC in undergrad, you know, English literature, American literature, uh, poetry, you know, really under like being taught academically, you know, story structure, um, you know, hero's journey and all that stuff. But at the same time, I was sort of kind of getting a second degree in a way at the Jungle Cruise in storytelling and in improvisation and, you know, reading an audience and understanding how to tailor a show to a specific audience, you know, within eight minutes. So those two things work really nicely together. Um, and I think kind of the storytelling chops that I got at USC and the comic timing cho chops that I got at the Jungle Cruise uh, have, have also kind of worked really well um, together for me. Throughout my entire career, everywhere I've been. And everyone loves asking questions about the Jungle Cruise. They love it. <laughs> like, oh, that's so cool. I can't believe that was my dream job when I was a kid. Uh, and it was my dream job when I was a kid, too. Yeah. No, my favorite thing when I go on the Jungle Cruise is seeing the jokes they come up with that are like their jokes versus like the script jokes. <laughs> like how they get so much more excited for those jokes. Oh. Of course, of course. Because they're, they're the thrill of going off script, you know? Yeah. No, it's where you get, sh it's your time to shine. Um, so yeah, obviously now you have World Builder. How did you come up with the idea for that and kind of start it? Well, um, it's interesting. So I, um, as I said, I, I worked around town for about five years at WDI, but also at place called Thinkwell for about three and a half years and then freelance for about a year or so. And um, I saw at all of these places that I was working that, um, you know, I kept hearing these words like interactivity and gamification. And at the time, you know, this, it was very controversial to even say these words like in a brainstorm. Uh, and I kind of saw that a lot of these companies, you know, don't really have the, 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 the skill set to deliver on that request from a client. Um, be, just because they don't really understand the technology, uh, specifically game engine technology. And, you know, I, I, I didn't know anything about game engines at the time. I just knew that there was an important thing that I didn't know. And so, you know, this was also around the time, I think the first iPhones had just come out and people were walking around the parks glued to their screens and just all the designers were freaking out, you know, because all of a sudden there was no berm. And, you know, you, you were always connected to the real world, you know, which is like a fundamental change of the experience when you're at Disneyland. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of talk about interactive experiences and, you know, can we go, oh, we could go to these different rides and check in on Foursquare and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, sort of the early stages of interactivity in parks. And I, I, I just realized, you know, I have a degree in English. I really, I think this is where things are going. Um, so I should probably go back to school. So, um, Actually, somebody who was a was an intern with me at Imagineering 
was the person who kind of made me aware of the interactive media program at USC in the cinema school. And I applied and I got in and things just sort of took off from there. Um, and, uh, you know, I started doing some consulting on some interactive projects, but the big thing that really happened is, again, I started to learn about these game engines and I started to use the game engines. And um, there, was a, there was a project, uh, I, I got hired as a freelancer for ThinkWell while I was in grad school um, to be the writer uh, for two major attractions at at uh, Warner Brothers World, Abu Dhabi, which is a theme park uh, in Abu Dhabi that just opened about two years ago. So they brought me in because they had known me previously as a writer and also they knew that I was a big comic book nerd. So they brought me in to, you know, sort of write concept treatments for the Batman ride and the Justice League ride. And, you know, they hired me to write a script, but I was learning all this awesome stuff in grad school. And so what I did was I, I basically built a simulation of the ride in a game engine. And the script that I delivered was like me doing my Batman voice, you know, as like scratch track audio for this ride that you could ride through in VR and see, actually see, oh, you know, this dialogue is way too long for this scene, or it doesn't match up with what I'm seeing on the screen. And so rather than writing, you know, like a more traditional screenplay, um, which, you know, in film, there's a lot of like flexibility with editing and timing and things like that. But with an attraction, the timing is everything. Um, you know, the show control sequence for each scene. So I was able to get some of that early work into a game engine and did an early visualization um, for those attractions. And so then we move forward to two years ago. I was back at Thinkwell and they actually sent me to Abu Dhabi. Now it was not concept anymore. Now it was under construction. And they were having some issues with the Batman ride and integrating, you know, the different show control programming things and figuring out the timing. Um, some of these exact issues, things like, you know, the, the vehicle is turning away from the screen too late and the media ends. So, you know, the set extension in the scene goes black before the vehicle turns away. So what do we do? Do we make the vehicle turn away sooner or do we delay the media or do we ask the media vendor to add additional frames of media to the end of that? Um, so there were, you know, there were all of these kind of friction points within the construction process. And that was the first time I had really been on site, you know, during production for a project of this scale. Prior to that project, I'd done mostly concept work, but this was full blown production of a major, you know, billion dollar project. And, um, you know, I was just essentially standing there in a hard hat, seeing these these clashes and these issues being found very, very late in the game. You know, have like a you know five, six, seven year timeline development cycle for some of these projects, and these things were being found. You know, months if not weeks before opening day, and so you know, I just kind of realized there has to be a better way. And I kept working on the software that I had used to do that original simulation and kept developing it and kept building at it. And, and that's basically what World Builder is, is it's, you know, it's a company, but it's also a software. And the idea is that World Builder is a modern pre-visualization tool and show programming tool for you know, multimedia immersive attractions that includes theme parks, but also museums and live events and, you know, the entire experience category. The idea is what if there is essentially a virtual, you know, digital twin of the thing that you're going to build and all the different designers, you know, you have your video person, your audio person, your 3D modeler, your ride vehicle expert, they're all working in the same shared 
sandbox that's like a 3D you know space that you can navigate. And that way, you know, when you make changes to your scope, for example, if you update the SketchUp model, you know, you can see immediately in the simulation, like, oh, well, that's going to affect this, and then that change will affect this, and then the sight line is blown, and then the vehicles can see each other, and you know, dispatch interval isn't going to work, and all that stuff. So the purpose of World Builder is to find these mistakes much, much earlier in the process so that when you're in the field, you're just executing. And this is something that, this is not revolutionary in film. You know, this, this, is, this is the process now. You know, uh, previs is just an accepted and understood part of the production process for film. Um, because the last thing that you want on one of these mega Hollywood blockbusters is, you know, to be like finding your camera angle on set when time is ticking and, you know, money is just is flowing. You just want to be executing and have found your shots beforehand. So Hollywood gets that and that's what they're doing. But that type of technology hasn't really come to our industry yet. Um, you know, there's the film and TV previs. And then on the other extreme, you know, there's previs being done for like architecture and engineering and construction. Um, but World Builder sort of sits right in the middle of those two, where you know architecture and entertainment meet to create an experience. Um, so that's what we do. Thank you for that. Um, so I guess going off of that, how would you describe the process that? you all go through when you're working on a project from like start to finish to get kind of what your client needs or how you go about working with yeah. them. So the interesting thing there is I, I believe that our product, our software is actually itself an entirely new process. So the process that we use is quite different from, you know, the standard process, which involves a lot of, pencils and paper and, you know, 2D sketches and illustrations and concept artwork renderings and things like that. And um, again, our process is very different where, you know, if we get a new project, we, we instantly, you know, coming out of the first brainstorm, we throw it into the game engine. And what I mean by that is like, let's say you're doing a new ride, um, and you come out of your brainstorm and all you have is a napkin sketch of like, oh, maybe, you know, this is the load station and then here's scene one in this circle and then scene two in this circle. It's an incredibly crude napkin sketch. Our process is we scan that napkin sketch and, you know, put it in our system at a reasonable scale. Um, and then as early as possible on day one, you know, get a vehicle going through that napkin sketch and just start to start to see the timing and the pacing of what the actual experience is. And then, you know, as the, as the design develops, maybe the next step is just to be to extrude some very simplistic walls and sketch up. Um, so you can break out your show scenes. And, um, and, you know, but then it continues to iterate and evolve and you get more detailed 3D models in there and you get, you know, you replace my Batman voice with like the real voice actor's voice at some point, um, you know, and you sort of keep updating these assets. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a real time digital twin that reflects what you're going to build. So it's a start to finish pipeline. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you finish on, on opening day of the actual attraction, you have created a digital version of the attraction. It is identical. It has the same show programming, the same elements, the same geometry, it's identical. And then the, um, the digital version that we built can actually then become the operating system that runs the attraction. So we're actually not throwing out that pre-visualization work at all. It's not a sunk cost. It just transitions into becoming the operating software because you figured it all out virtually. Now, instead of sending your commands to, you know, virtual lights or virtual audio sources in a space, you're now sending the same commands at, you know, the same timing 
but you're sending them via you know DMX and OSC and and um, you know actual show control commands that you're sending out to the real speakers and the real lights in the real environment. So yeah, you know that's that's our process, but I think that's pretty pretty different than what most other people are doing. Yeah, for sure. So I guess then my next question would be, what's a time that maybe a project didn't go as well as you had anticipated and what you guys learned from that to move forward? Um, well, if, if any of my team members are watching, they're probably having a good laugh right now because they know exactly what I'm about to say. Um, we, we, we just had a, um, we just had a project with a very challenging client who um, didn't really have a vision for what they wanted. And this is something that happens a lot where, you know, being a professional creative is, you know, being an idea machine and not just throwing out random ideas, but recognizing the good ones. And a piece of advice that I got, I don't even remember who it was from, it was so long ago, but like being a professional creative director is not about having the best idea in the room. It's about recognizing the best idea in the room. And so a lot of times clients will not know what they really want. Um, they'll give you some rough criteria and framework and you know they sort of think they know, but you actually really need to take their direction and form a cohesive concept and then get their approval. Um, and you know, we, we, we had a challenging time uh, getting the creative locked with this client. Um, and uh, you know, it, it was a challenging install and um, production was tough, but you know, we, we ultimately got through it and um, it was kind of a miracle to be honest. <laughs> oh, and you know, just, just as an aside, yeah. um, Something that I've learned on my installs that I think would be beneficial for people to hear is like, you know, you spend years designing these things and you think you have it all figured out. And then you get to the construction point and you have an opening date and you realize actually some of these things are not going to work. And then you sort of throw all theory that you had out the window and it becomes a race against the clock because you have an opening day. And so, you know, then you need to get really creative and get your producer and, you know, your creative team on the same page about how do we get this thing open on time? You know, does that mean we need to cut this element or substitute, you know, some, you know, simpler lighting fixture for a more complicated lighting pattern? And it's, you know, it's it becomes sort of an all hands on deck situation where you're just rapidly problem solving and um, kind of throwing your your plan book out the window during those last couple of weeks. Yeah. At least that's been my experience. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. Um, so I guess what's one of the benefits, because obviously World Builder is a smaller team that you guys have, what's one of the benefits you've found working at a smaller company versus working at a bigger one like Disney when you were interning? Yeah, so I've had the opportunity to work several times for Disney in different capacities. Um, and I've done some consulting for Universal uh, out in Florida. And, um, and I've also had the opportunity to work at some smaller companies. Um, I would say more, you know, smaller and mid-sized companies. And the fact of the matter is, look, Disney has the best product out there. They have the best parks. They have the best IP. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it the best place to work as a young person. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a trade-off that you have to be willing to make. You know, you're, you're not going to be working on projects that are necessarily as glamorous. Um, but at the same time, the, the financials are completely different in the sense that Imagineering is an internal department that services the Disney theme parks. 
Universal Creative is an internal department that services Universal theme parks. These other companies out there, they don't have the benefit of a ton of overhead and a ton of money from some corporate, you know, mega parent company. So they survive by recruiting talent. And that's certainly not to say that there, there isn't talent at Universal and Disney because they also recruit top talent. But I think the difference is um, Disney recruits, Disney and Universal recruit for single skill talent. Um, you know, they want someone who's elite at whatever they do. It's the best concept artist out of Art Center, you know, or the best, uh, you know, um, I don't know, the best engineer out of whatever the top engineering school is. Um, but, you know, and that makes sense. That makes sense because they have the scale and they have a process and, you know, everyone sort of knows their role. And on the flip side, at a smaller company, you know, they, they just have to get a lot more bang for their buck. And so it's, it's the exact opposite where, you know, you don't have to worry about stepping on somebody else's toes or overreaching into what would really be a different person's responsibility. It becomes more like how much can you contribute and what different things can you contribute? And, you know, how can, how can you step up and say, oh, you know what? I can take a shot at that because I know how to do that. And um, it's, easier, it's easier to sort of define yourself as a, as a multi-talented person and use, you know, multiple skills at the same time, be more versatile um, at some of these smaller companies. And it's a really great, great place to cut your teeth. And also it exposes you to a wide variety of different projects. You know, like if you work at Universal or Disney, you're working on, you know, theme parks or cruise ships um, or hotels, you know, that are all the Disney brand. But when you're working at some of these other companies, you're doing museum exhibits and, you know, traveling exhibitions and live pop-up events. And a lot of these things are like fundamentally different from each other and being exposed to those different types of projects is really a great thing. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people in our industry now who are furloughed and who are looking for work. And, you know, this is, this is obviously a down cycle in our industry right now. And the last time this happened to this extent, I think was after, um, uh, Tokyo Disneyland and Epcot op opened, you know, both of those big parks opened and then there weren't any more big projects in development. So there were a lot of layoffs and a lot of those layoffs were people who had been at Disney for decades and, you know, re-entering the job market after you've been at one place that has one process and you've been doing one thing for a long time, it's tough. It's tough. And, you know, it, you, you, you've learned how to do things a specific way and you have a certain set of skills that are perfect for Disney theme park design. But, you know, making those skills transferable, look, there, there's nothing like Disney theme parks. So, you know, it's, it's harder to find adjacent uh, jobs. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned about people who are laid off now from Universal and Disney, you know, being able to find other work in adjacent industries. Um, but uh, I think it, it is easier for, for people who have worked in a lot of different places and seen a lot of different processes and worked with a lot of different people on different types of projects. Because um, you're just more, you know, you just have a wider set of skills and you're more prepared. Yeah, so kind of a follow-up question. Um, I know you mentioned that like you, or smaller companies tend to hire more versatile people. What's something that you look for in team members when you're going to hire them, both hard skills, soft skills? Um, well, again, so I think my, my company is a little bit different than uh, um, a lot of companies uh, yeah. in terms of their who, who they're looking for. Um, and I look for, 
primarily I'm looking for Unity developers, you know, coders who normally work on video games um, within game engines and are fluent in coding for digital experiences. Um, but that's not all. I'm looking for coders who are passionate themed entertainment people. And, you know, I, that's, that's, not, that's not a cliche thing to say. It, it, it really is true. It makes all the difference. Um, uh, one of the best hires that I've ever made came out of a uh, TEA GibGab event, you know, where, where, you know, I had a table and I met 60 different you know, students and saw 60 different resumes and had 60 different three minute conversations with these people. Um, and there was one person out of the 60 who, you know, was a huge theme park nerd, but also had elite level Unity developer skills. And that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, and so then the next question would be, where do you hope to see World Builder go within the next few years? I know you kind of talked about this a little bit before we went live, but if you could just elaborate for everyone. Yeah, so what I've found is that, um, you know, when, when you think about the totality of experiences, which can be anything from a theme park to even a, you know, sporting event in a huge stadium or a concert at the O2 Arena or something like that. You know, these are all experiences, but there's no, there's no standard operating system that runs all of these experiences. Um, it's just this mishmash of different companies and their own proprietary software and their own proprietary hardware and making them work together and installing them on site and having people from their team come over and program them. And you know the the vision for World Builder is, you know, we to up until recently we had essentially been using our own software um, as a tool to, you know, kind of streamline our own process and make ourselves more competitive. Um, but kind of the pivot that we've made and the realization that we've had since COVID hit is, you know. I think this the software is a product and it can be productized. So the vision for World Builder is a subscription-based, um, it's called SaaS, uh, software as a service. Um, you know, like you pay a monthly fee for Adobe Creative Cloud. You know, you would pay a, a fixed monthly rate for World Builder, which would be, you know, your cloud-based collaborative design. So your entire team can work together and share the vision, but not have not need coders, not need game engine people, not need specialists. You're just, it's an intuitive interface that you're using to create these worlds, to build these worlds, if you will. And the fact of the matter is, you know, you have people rapidly learning game engines, but you also have this huge upswell of things like, you know, Minecraft and Roblox and, um, you know, Super Mario Maker and, um, you know, even Fortnite has some like building elements in it. Uh, and, you know, kids are coming up and, you know, this is how they're creating their experiences. They, this is this is what is normal to them is using a game engine and an interface that's easy to click on buttons and navigate. And, you know, you're playing a video game basically, but you are building an experience in a digital world. So, you know, the, these people are going to graduate and enter the workforce and then say, wait, th that's not how this is done professionally? You guys are still using pencil and paper? That's crazy. So um, that's, that's the path that I see forward uh, is, is to kind of take those learnings from content creation tools in video games and the interfaces that they use to make it intuitive and you know visual to to not code these things but to arrange and organize and design these things and have every member of a team have a have a have a license have a seat and pay a fixed rate so they can use it across all of their projects you don't need to worry about if it makes sense to do previs during concepts or blue sky uh, no you just you, you just do it for everything and it becomes the new process and the new home for each project uh, where you see the current state of the project 
at all times from any location in the world. Yeah, that sounds really cool and definitely something that the industry, it sounds like from what I've gathered so far, could use. So yeah, I guess, what's your favorite project that you've been working on? I know we talked about your least favorite, but I realized I didn't ask you what your favorite one was. Oh boy. <laughs> this was not on the list of questions that you sent me before the... Uh, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Favorite project that I've worked on? You know, honestly, there are so many. Um, I'll mention one, which is uh, when I was at Thinkwell, we did a concept for uh, a Saturday Night Live experience um, that was going to be uh, on the Las Vegas Strip. And, you know, we had a charrette, and, you know, Seth Myers came to the charrette, and we, we came up with this really, really cool idea for like a walkthrough, you know, that had pulsed rooms and each room kind of represented one day in the week of production for an episode. And then there was a dark ride finale um, that was like the live taping of the show essentially. Um, but one of the most interesting challenges of that project was, you know, SNL has been around for so long that a lot of different people sort of identify with different you know, eras of the show and different casts. So, you know, how do you sort of aggregate the interests of a group of people, you know, of different different ages and, you know, populate the dark ride with tailored content for, for those type of people. And then, you know, there's gonna be like a Jimmy Fallon lounge and a bunch of cool stuff, but, you know, a lot of projects never go anywhere. It, but, you know, it was still, it was still great. Um, it was still great, and you know, if something that that I've I've learned as I've gotten older and I've worked more and more is like, when I was younger, I I really would look at these mega attractions that would open, you know, like, you know, today it would be like a Galaxy's Edge or something like that, and I would just say like, I have to work on a project like this, you know, like this is what I'm going to do, and. I've come to sort of realize that um, I, I take pleasure in the work from collaborating with other really talented people. And it's actually, for me, it's less about like, is this gonna open or not? Is it gonna get built? And it's more about like, man, this was a blast to work on. And I met some awesome people and we came up with such a cool concept. And I hope to work with these people again, you know? Yeah, thank you. And then we're gonna have one more, one kind of fun question before we move on to our final question. So the fun question is, what do you think makes a land or attraction successful? I know it's not super fun, but like, what are just like personally the things that you find to be something that makes it successful? Um, if it causes an increase in attendance and per capita spending, then it is <laughs> successful. Uh, no, um, I mean, yes, but, <laughs> Solid answer, but, yeah. but, but from a creative standpoint, um, I think those are two very different things, you know, something that makes an attraction successful is very different from something that makes a land successful. Um, and that, that has to do with sort of the, the magic circle, if you will, of where the story takes place, you know, when you have an attraction, the suspension of disbelief and immersion in the story starts at the entrance to the queue. But for land, it starts at the entrance to the land. So I think, you know, thing, things are trending today towards more immersive lands. Um, obviously Pandora and Galaxy's Edge and Harry Potter. And, um, you know, there's there's been a lot of chatter about how it would be super cool to do a land based on Wakanda uh, from the Black Panther movie, which, would be really interesting to me, but um, to be to be a successful land, let me answer it this way: uh, for to to be a, a successful land, there needs to be a way for the guest, like a, just a natural call to action, that brings the guest into the story world. And you know, the the best example of that is uh, Wizarding World, um, because. It's such it's just such a perfect IP for a land because it is a school. And so 
you know, it makes sense that there are a bunch of people there and there are a bunch of kids there running around. And even the merchandise that you buy, the robes and the wands just further immerse you, you know? It's the actual merchandise is like the school uniform. And, um, you know, it's a very clear uh, call to action of like, yeah, okay, I'm a student at Hogwarts. Great, awesome. Um, you know, I think uh, I think it's it's interesting the the roots that Pandora and Galaxy's Edge have taken in the sense that um, you know they've 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 chosen to go more in terms of the the environmental design and um, you know less character driven um, you know which is which is a choice and neither is right or wrong but I think you know there's there's no catch all answer for any ip i think it's a really ip specific question where they found the right solution for harry potter um and a lot of people thought you know galaxy's edge the obvious decision would have been to make it a jedi academy you know where you go and learn to be a jedi um but you know they went a different way and the way that they went is actually really interesting and I think that that land has really only scratched the surface of what's really possible. Um, oh, and by the way, I think it was just like two two days ago they announced Galaxy's Edge was coming to The Sims. Um, and you know, so this is what I'm all about. You know, that's a digital twin of the physical land that they built, and I'm really interested in seeing how you know they continue to have this interplay between. Uh, the digital world and the physical world. I, I don't know if I answered your question. There's no, there's no secret sauce to making a great attraction or land that is the right answer every time. Um, but maybe the right answer is, you know, if it's an IP-based attraction, just understanding the IP and understanding that there is no catch-all solution for all IPs, and every IP will have its own unique solution. Yeah, that was a good answer. Um, and so then our final question before we open it up to audience questions is just kind of a ending. What advice do you have for people, for our USC students? Just kind of like any last bits of advice on things that they should be looking for who really want to get into the themed entertainment industry? Um, well, obviously, you know, getting some operational experience, you know, I, I, I can't recommend that enough. Just work at the park for one summer. Um, you'll learn so much. And you'll also have a lot more respect for the people that work there and you'll treat them much more nicely when you go next time. Uh, you know, so, so that's one thing, but also I would say, um, you know, we're at a very unique time in the industry right now. And I'm actually not talking about COVID. I'm talking again about game engines. And, you know, this is an industry that kind of really launched in 1955 you know, with Disneyland, you could say knots and all these other things, but let's just say, it, you know, our industry started in 1955 and Walt Disney kind of took these expert designers from, you know, animation and theater and film and really sort of reinvented the paradigm of the amusement park. Um, but everything since then for the last 65 years has kind of been iterative, you know, Yes, it's you know there's there's more technology and better special effects, but you know there's still there's still at the end of the day, uh, you know narrative arc rides um, and shows and parades and things like that. And you know most of the things that have been built at parks have have you know drawn from from uh, animation and film and theater uh, disciplines. But that's all changing now with game engines. And um, they have so many applications and they're actually, you know, they've kind of stopped referring to themselves as game engines and they're, they're calling themselves real time engines because, you know, their uses go way beyond games. And I think probably the most public example that people have seen is Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run at Galaxy's Edge, which is a, you know, real time attraction with no pre-rendered media where you know you can interact with the screen and see your input on the screen in real time because it's being rendered on the fly 
um, and that attraction, it, you know, it, it 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 has its flaws, but it's a it's an absolute technological marvel um, for a variety of reasons. But you know, that that attraction really, I think, has opened a lot of eyes to the potential of game engines. And so, to answer your question about what advice I would give, um, if there are current students listening, you know, take intro to game design in the interactive school as an elective or you know intro to unity or or just take some online tutorials you know about unreal and you know how to use it because um you know it's it's a skill that's just going to become more and more valuable and more and more uh in demand um you know i i i didn't learn how to code until i was like 29 and I'm still terrible at it, but, but you know, you, you don't have to be the best coder in the world. You just, you know, you just need to know enough to get your concepts across and to be able to sort of just understand how, how things are made. Because the way that things are made in game engines, the production process is so fundamentally different from pre-rendered media. It really is like apples and oranges. Um, so, you know, you you heard it here first. Game engines are the future. Yeah. That's what I would be studying. That's that's what I, I can tell studying. you. Even in architecture with COVID, we actually responded last semester with using Unreal Engine for our final models because we couldn't build the paper ones, and it was a lot cooler and more successful in conveying what we yeah. were trying to show. Yeah. So yeah, I can agree to that. So yeah, now we'll open it up to some audience questions. Um, so yeah, from Laura Hernandez, how would you say viral marketing plays a role in immersive experiences? Um, that is a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, th this, this kind of ties into to this larger thing that's, that's happening here where, um, you know, the, the, the at home experience or the outside of park experience is becoming just as important as the location-based experience where, you know, like ARGs, for example, where they start mailing you stuff, you know, weeks if not months before, uh, you know, your experience actually happens. But that really drives engagement. Um, and, um, you know, there's there's sort of been this Achilles heel that's that's been exposed by COVID um for these attractions which is if the physical location is closed you know if the gates are closed spending drops to zero because the people aren't there so you know how, how do you how do you monetize what you have when people are not there and again the solution i think is with a digital twin made in a game engine but i think sort of you know from a storytelling standpoint you know there, there's so much that can be done with the lead up to the to the experience, um, building excitement, you know, building a deeper story, setting expectations. Um, absolutely, you know, these are th these are all things that are s so new now that they're still being figured out what the right way to do it is. But that's where all the innovation is happening, and you know, these different form factors of location based entertainment. You know, the six to eight person experience. Uh, things like the void or dreamscape immersive, you know, those those are really sort of new different form factors of location based entertainment. Um, and, you know, ARGs send people all around the world. Um, and they usually are marketing tools for a larger experience. Um, like there's one done for Halo, there's one done for the Dark Knight. Um, there's one done for Tron Legacy, you know, and it just it it engages the most passionate fans and you get a lot of money a lot of bang for your buck in terms of the marketing money that you spend because you create these evangelists that aren't employees they're fans and they're doing the marketing for you so events or parameters doesn't match up with your game engine software are you having to constantly measure as built in the field doesn't match up with the engine software. 
So when the software doesn't match up with construction, I, which I think you started to touch on earlier, but. Right, right. So, um, you know, so by the way, quick shout out, this is my buddy Patrick asking this question, <laughs> who uh, worked alongside me at the Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage in 2000. Yeah. Um, and now works for uh, Nickelodeon in their experience design group. Um, well, so, you know, the, a lot of the things that I've, I've sort of been talking about, just, just to be totally honest, are theoretical. Um, you know, and this is the roadmap for the world builder software. And the idea is that, you know, uh, maybe you start with a SketchUp model. But then at some point in the production process, you know, you, you get into a really detailed BIM, you know, integration model. Um, and, you know, so so then you, you don't have these things. Um, and, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to get to 100% plug and play for the exact reason that, that Patrick is saying. Sometimes things just come from the shops and they're just wrong, you know. Uh, but but the idea is to really mitigate that as much as possible and and condense that integration period from you know months down to maybe even days. Yeah, thank you. And Patrick also apologized for his wording. He said, "Sorry, that was oddly worded." Um, so this next one's from Hannah Sandine, and that is, "What video game would you adapt to an attraction if yeah. you could?" That's a great question. I mean, you know, if if it were possible, I would choose Portal, but I don't think that's really possible to do. Um, I think there, there's a game called The Witness. Uh, that's a really good example of. I mean, it would it would it would it's a you know landline puzzle game. It would adapt really really well. And there's, that's such great puzzle design and game design. But one that I've been thinking about recently is the Assassin's Creed franchise. Um, and the reason is because, you know, uh, there's there's been a lot of talk about VR in theme parks. And I think in general, you know, it doesn't really work because it's, it's not social. You're, you're very sequestered. And anytime you lean on the technology, you know, Anytime the technology is the selling point of the attraction, you're doomed because it's going to be outdated by the time it opens. Um, you know, so using VR is it, it's kind of a gimmick and it has a very short shelf life. However, it's different if it's being used as a tool, as, a, as part of a kit of tools to immerse people. And so I've been thinking about the Assassin's Creed franchise specifically because within that franchise, you know, like modern day people, they put on this headset and they're able to like mind meld with their ancestors who were assassins and see their whole lineage and, you know, oh, my, you know, great, 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 great grandfather was an assassin. I'm going to like be in his mind. And so to me, that's a really interesting creative conceit that, you know, VR almost works perfectly for that. Um, but I, I would not make the experience in VR. What I would do is almost have a pre-show in VR, you know, where you're, you're brought into this room, you put on a VR headset, which they never refer to as a VR headset, but it would be, you know, your assassin scanning device. I'm not sure what it's called in the games. Um, you know, and then, you know, you have that, that search through your ancestry and you're being teleported to this ancient world and then you take off the headset and you're in a different room and you're in the past, you know, you're, you're somewhere else, either because you physically tracked forward into a different space or because you've done like a flyaway room thing, a uh, room within a room. Um, but I think, I think that would be a really cool game to adapt uh, to a theme park. I've heard that, you know, Nintendo might be doing some stuff too. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, so our next question is from Paige Ryder. Do you think some of these technologies could spread so much that people no longer feel a need to go to the physical space? You kind of just touched on that briefly. Um, I, I don't think it'll ever be it'll ever be able to be a replacement, um, because you know, 
going to a theme park is a lot like the theatrical cinematic experience. There's, there's something about the fact that a lot of people are having this shared experience that is really unique. Um, but the question is, what if you can approximate, let's say, 70% of the in-park experience, say in VR? You know, you can get 70% of the way there and only charge maybe 30% of what you would charge to get into Disneyland. Then it becomes a little more compelling um, from a value proposition standpoint. Uh, but I, I believe that, that the future is sort of connecting the two and that the at-home experience won't necessarily replace the in-person experience, but it will supplement it. And I also see a lot of RPG type of elements from video games uh, bleeding into theme parks in the future. And by that, I don't just mean role-playing like in Galaxy's Edge where you say bright suns to people. I'm talking about like, you know, you leave the park for a day and then you come back the next day and you know you pick up where you've left off in terms of your own story and your own metadata that's tied to you as a guest or you as a character that you've created for yourself. And you're continuing to develop that character um, at home in the online version. You know, maybe maybe you know you, you level up in a game at home and get a fast pass. You know, for or you know entrance to the equivalent of Club 33, but it's only for you know, the gamers. Um, so yeah, I see connection, but not ever total replacement. Okay, and the next question from Joshua Mandela. Would you be able to talk about the experience of writing the attractions you've worked on, seeing it from ideation to the finished project? I think that that would be very rewarding. That's a really, really great question. Um, the experience of riding the attraction is not rewarding. The experience of seeing guests exit the attraction is incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, when they're coming off and they're clapping, you know, I'm like getting goosebumps even just thinking about it right now. Uh, but riding it, all you see are the mistakes and all of the flaws and oh man this sight line yikes we could have done better here and by that point you've just lost all objective you know ability to rate or evaluate what you've built because you know you've seen it from every angle you've walked the ride path every day and you know you're you're staring at these scenic things not for 30 seconds in a show scene but for hours every single day and so when you ride it, you're, you're seeing all of the imperfections that nobody else has seen. Um, you know, so you really have to make an effort to keep that in check. Thank you. From Nicholas to Frank, you mentioned before how important it is to understand operations. Are there any resources like books or podcasts, for example, that you can recommend? That's another great question. I, I, don't, I don't really know that there are are a bunch of books about operations. I mean, there's sort of a lot of books about, you know, an ex-cast member will write about, oh, my, my time working in food service at Disneyland and that kind of thing. But I don't, I don't know how really necessarily helpful that is. The one book I would recommend is called, uh, I may have this wrong, but it's called Walt's Revolution by the Numbers. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's it. Walt's Revolution by the Numbers. Um, and it's basically about sort of the economic planning and the math behind Disneyland and how it was planned and, you know, um, a lot of the sort of, you know, guest flow equations and, and uh, yeah, I think, I, I think it might be out of print, but um, that's a really good one. It's called Walt's Revolution by the Numbers. And once you read it, you know, you won't look at attractions the same way. Another question from Paige. Do you worry about the uncanny valley? I've been studying how that relates to animal-like animatronics. Man, that's such a good question. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think about this a lot. And I think, um, again, you know, it's, it's all about where the immersion starts. And if you're just sort of, you know, walking out of the parking lot through the turnstiles, you know, getting your ticket scanned, and then boom, you're presented with an animatronic figure, it's going to be really jarring, and it's going to look fake, and it's going to be really uncomfortable and weird. But if, if you know, if you've been very carefully and gradually immersed into a land, you know, like, like the old metaphor of the, the frog in a boiling pot of water, um, you know, then, then you've, you've sort of primed your brain to suspend disbelief, because you, you want you want to suspend disbelief. Every guest wants to believe that what they're seeing is real. Um, it's a lot easier to do that if you've been through you know a queue and a pre-show and you know, several show scenes and you're, you're you know it's just sort of making you forget the outside world and what you even the other attractions in the park. You know, uh, there's there is an interesting discussion to be had about. Um, media-based attractions, you know, things like Spider-Man or Transformers. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because we're so focused on screens as a society that our brains have almost been wired to suspend disbelief when we watch a movie or a TV show, even though it's a flat 2D image, you know? When you're seeing an animatronic figure, it's a 3D full-scale, lifelike robot that's moving in front of you. And yet, there is sometimes this uncanny valley issue that doesn't happen when we're in a media-based attraction where we're looking at a flat plane being projected on. Um, and I think, yeah, that's just because we've, we've been so trained. But, um, you know, also stay away from humans. Stay away from humans. Um, doesn't bother me as much, you know, if it's a Navi, for example. But if if it's if it's a human, it just doesn't work. Back back in the fifties, you know, the, the, the single point of articulation, um, you know, attacking natives on the Jungle Cruise just blew people's minds. You know, what am I looking at? Is this how is this possible? You know, um, but we're just much more sophisticated now. And, and then also, of, of course, you know, don't don't let the guests see the animatronic too much. Um, you know, like always be on like a, a bumpy uh, jeep. You know, as you're going past it really quickly, so it's like a you know handheld shaky cam, so your eyes can't like register and deconstruct it and you know see that it's fake. Um, uh, you know, don't have a slow-moving vehicle in broad daylight. Just go by it really, really, really slowly. Um, in, in the chats here, I'm, I'm seeing somebody wants to know what the Uncanny Valley is. The Uncanny Valley is basically the idea that with, like, a CGI human-like character, or in this case, an animatronic figure, um, the closer that it gets to being photoreal um, or indistinguishable from a real person, the more fake it looks because it's awkward and uncomfortable, and it's an approximation of um, a real human. Oh, and by the way, one of the first people to figure this out was Mark Davis. You know, all of those scenes take the Jungle Cruise, you know, the, the Native Uprising scene, um, or of course, all of the sight gags in Pirates. You know, all of the Pirates in Pirates, except for Johnny Depp, they don't have human faces. They're these sort of, they're almost cartoonish, you know, and they're they're abstracted in a way so that they don't look like actual humans. But our brain doesn't even realize that. Um, they're they're these exaggerated caricatures, and in a way, that's you know more reassuring than the most advanced uh, human-like animatronic figure. Okay, so I think we're starting to run out of time. Um, so I'll just ask if you have any last thing that you'd like to leave our audience with before we wrap up. Um, I guess it would just be to to keep keep making things. You know, even even during this time, 
Um, if it's by yourself or, you know, even better if it's with a small group, just it, it's, it, it's never been easier to make experiences for other people, even if, you know, even if they take place on a screen or even if it's a tiny theatrical production in your apartment, you know, that you sell tickets to two at a time for people to come. Um, just doing stuff like that, every single project that you do, you learn so much from. And, you know, the things that you take there apply to your next to your next project. And then you have an amazing portfolio piece out of it, too. Um, so, you know, keep, keep going to these places and being fans of them, but also, you know, when you, when you, when you, this, this is advice that I got a long time ago, um, before I, you know, studied creative writing or anything like that. If you go into a movie and you don't like the movie, when, when you leave, um, don't just say, oh man, that movie sucked. Do the exercise of how could I make it better? What could I have done to make it better? What would I have changed? And take, you know, and actually think about that for like a long period of time. And, you know, take that same kind of approach to attractions that you experience. You know, what did I not like? What did I like? How could I make that better? How would I have done things differently? And then, you know, make make experiences of your own. Um, it could be it could be as low budget as, as possible, but uh, just keep keep making stuff and you'll just get better every time. All right. Thank you. You had a lot of really great advice tonight and definitely a lot of interesting <laughs> stories. Thanks, and please, please, um, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any questions, or I'm, I'm very available these days. So, uh, yeah, happy to chat further with anyone that, that would like to. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for talking to us. And fight on. Yeah, fight on.